Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah everyone uh, uh, to our fifth lecture on Bayt al-Maqdis step by step. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that everyone is good and uh, joining us from different places. Um, it just a uh, reminder I was told to mention that please uh, uh, join, uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, so you can watch the lecture directly from here. And uh, finally, uh, next week will be our final class. So uh, there might be not uh, a reminder email sent. So please tune in at the same time on the channel and you will be able to see uh, the stream directly from there. Um, today, our lecture is quite uh, an interesting topic. Uh, discussing the uh, occupation of Beit al a thousand years ago, 900 years ago, and how it was liberated, and what we can learn from that in terms of the uh, coming liberation of uh, Beit al -Maqdis. So this will be our uh, discussion uh, in today's uh, class. So we'll be discussing the Crusades and uh, the occupation of Beit al-Maqdis and how it was liberated by Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi and what happened after that. Uh, but uh, building up on what we uh, discussed from last week, uh, last week we talked about the first liberation which was done by uh, Omar uh, ibn Khattab uh, of Beit al-Maqdis and how that uh, was done. When a question uh, is posed uh, what is the difference between the Fath of the Muslims by Umar ibn Khattab and previous occupation? And was this Fath an occupation or was it something different? And what we have learned even from non-Muslims who uh, have discussed this issue that uh, the Fath of Bayt al-Maqdis was rather different because it did not involve the same way of ex exclusion as the others. What Umar ibn Khattab did was one of the most peaceful uh, uh, liberations uh, and uh, and uh, the, the most peaceful uh, liberation of the land uh, for centuries. There was no uh, blood uh, bloody conquest. Uh, churches continued to be built. Uh, Omar bin Khattab's assurance of safety uh, to the people of Elia of Beit al maqdis and how that was done. Uh, is rather uh, interesting and the Muslims have managed to establish a system that enabled Jews, Christians and Muslims to live uh, in Beit al-Maqdis in Jerusalem together for the first time uh, and Omar uh, brought the differences together and uh, allowed a notion of inclusion based on, uh, based on Islam and Omar was faithful to this inclusive vision as Karen Armstrong, a British historian uh, and uh, an ex-nun argues. And unlike the Jews and the Christians, the Muslims did not attempt to exclude others from uh, Jerusalem's uh, holiness. And uh, the Muslims allowed this place to be for the whole world. Uh, and what we see is quite interesting is that the Muslims re, uh, uh, excuse me, revived the uh, heritage of Islam. They didn't see Islam just as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but they, say, they saw Islam as, um, uh, as the religion of all the prophets, and they revived their memory uh, inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. The gate directly under, under Al-Jamah Al-Aqsa was known as the gate of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the gate east of it, uh, that you see in the uh, image here uh, in, uh, in, in, in front of you, you can see the uh, three gates were named by the Muslims as, um, uh, as the gate of uh, Mihrab of Maryam. The gates of Mihrab of Maryam, you can see here, uh, if I'm able to zoom in, the gate here was known as the gate of the Prophet. The gates here were known as the gates of the Mihrab of Maryam. And many other structures were named after uh, the Prophets of Islam, the Mahd of Isa, the gates of Astul Asbat. Uh, and you can see this in the eastern basement of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. A dome was 
built to commemorate uh, uh, Isa alayhi salam and the place where Maryam alayhi salam uh, is believed to have worshipped Allah and this uh, was named after her and the dome was named after Isa alayhi salam uh, domes of Musa, uh, Bab Siti Maryam, the gate of our uh, mother Maryam, the gates of the tribes and many many things. For the first time uh, for centuries the Muslims managed to have a multicultural, multi-religious uh, society. Uh, however, some Muslim uh, uh, governors were not adhering to this religion, like the example of the Egyptian Khalif al-Hakim, who destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and later allowed it to be rebuilt. His mother was Christian and he was a Shia uh, Fatimi uh, Khalif. Uh, but this uh, was something that lived with across the centuries from the Umayyads, from the Abbasid, uh, across the Fatimids with that exception, and also through the time of the Seljuks. During the Umayyad period, uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan created a three-dimensional uh, image of the city and established the Islamic presence visually in the city, the skyline, was no longer the churches, the skyline became Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and particularly uh, the dome of the rock right in the heart of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, and uh, Al-Mubarak. Um, uh, some are asking about the attendance. If I ask, uh, uh, please to share the attendance sheet so people can uh, fill it up uh, to the team. Uh, working in the backstage, we will be grateful uh, to them. Um, uh, and you see um, the whole of the Al Masjid Al Aqsa uh, on the whole of the mountain was rebuilt, was recreated. Al Jama, where Omar ibn Khattab created the first uh, uh, building inside Al Masjid Al Aqsa, inside the four walls of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, was now uh, reconstructed. Uh, as al mughatta or al jamia al aqsa and there are differences between masjid jamia and musalla in islamic law uh, so this was known al jamia al aqsa qibli today it's known as qibli qibli in arabic just literally means the southern building southern uh, but actually it's named al jamia al aqsa al aqsa jamia the congregational building or al mughatta the covered uh, place where the imam would lead the khutbah uh, and lead the prayers from the basement, the eastern basement, where uh, uh, a little while ago I showed you the mihrab of Maryam alayha salam. This is the eastern basement of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, and you can see here the gate, the, the triple gate is known as the gate of the mihrab of Maryam. And this basement was built underground to be able to hold the upper, uh, upper building. And the Jama' al-Aqsa, when it was first built by the Umayyads, is actually extended much bigger than it is today. This is the form it was in during the Abbasid period, but it used to extend all the way to the Western Wall and uh, up to around here in the Eastern Wall. Right in the heart of Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, you have the Dome of the Chain, that is the exact center of the Masjid al-Aqsa and next to it you have the Dome of the Rock and the Dome of the Prophet and the Dome of the Mi'raj and other domes were created uh, during the Umayyad period. So actually today uh, Al-Masjid al-Aqsa is, uh, uh, much of it is actually dates back to the Umayyads. The walls of the Masjid al-Aqsa uh, are in the four directions were rebuilt by the Umayyads at that time. Uh, at that time and it was a magnificent tr structure as you see here south of it and west of it you see the Umayyad palaces so the Umayyad built their palaces and you can see they, they, they did not uh, uh, are not elevated beyond the Masjid al-Aqsa they are below that uh, that level and you can see the gates and the walls and the structures in this uh, in this building so it was the uh, foundations uh, of uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa after the Fath were mainly made by the Umayyads built on the ancient foundations that Omar ibn Khattab uh, uh, built on and the earlier foundations that date back to uh, the earlier buildings of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak. So uh, uh, the question that many people raise 
uh, and they focus only on why did Abdul Malik build the first uh, the, the first dome in the Muslim world was built inside the Masjid al-Aqsa. The first mihrab was built in the Masjid al-Aqsa. Also, the minarets were built uh, from the time of Abdul Malik uh, during the early Umayyad uh, period. Many people ask the question, why did Abdul Malik build the Dome of the Rock? And this question is the wrong question to be asked because Abdul Malik did not just build the Dome of the Rock. You can see Al Jami' al Aqsa itself is much bigger than the Dome of the Rock. He also built the Dome of the Chain, he built the walls, he built, he rebuilt the walls, sorry, built the gates, built the uh, many other domes inside the Masjid al Aqsa. So it's the wrong question to ask. Uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, as a Muslim faqih, uh, he was one of the seven fuqaha of Medina. He built uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, as a whole, and part of it was the Dome of the Rock. And you can see in the image here that the Dome of the Rock wasn't as it was today. It was covered with mosaic from outside, golden mosaics from outside, uh, as you see in the image here uh, uh, in, front, uh, in front of you. Uh, beautifully structured and in the process of building uh, the Dome of the Rock uh, some accounts say 300,000 pieces of gold and some say 600,000 pieces of gold were left and Abdul Malik gave this money to the uh, two architects Yazid ibn Salam and uh, Salama uh, Qaisar ibn Salam Yazid ibn Salam and I forgot the other guy's name if someone can remind me of it, uh, I will be grateful to them. Yazid ibn Salam was one of the first architects. And um, if someone can re uh, remind me of the name, I'll be grateful to, to them. Um, so he gave each one of them uh, this money, this gold, as uh, a reward for building such magnificent uh, structures in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And instead of accepting this, instead of accepting uh, this reward for them, they responded and they said, no, uh, we would spend from our own money and the golds of our wives on this masjid. And they refused. Remember the concept of sending a gift to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa? They wanted this to continue as a legacy and to get the reward of it, not in the dunya, but to get the reward of it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they refused to take this. So uh, Abdul Malik said, the money is not to be taken back, uh, melt it and pour it on the doors and on the dome of the rock. And that's why the golden dome is actually because of the gold that was poured uh, from, uh, from this on the top of the uh, dome. So the question, many Orientalists and many Zionists try to argue that Abdul Malik built this for not for religious reasons, but for political reasons, uh, but it is uh, nonsense. And they try to quote uh, 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 something from Ali Aqubi, a fanatic Shia uh, historian who hated the Umayyads and suggested such a thing. So they take this account and blow it out of proportion. Many Orientalists actually even refuse this because the uh, narration itself is full of contradictions and al Yaqubi himself contradicts himself uh, later on. During the Abbasids, the first time the name Al-Quds was used, uh, and you see it here uh, on the, uh, 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 the first minted coin with the name Al-Quds. No one knows the name of the uh, architect. Uh, let me check it out uh, before we move on. Uh, Yazid ibn Salam and the second was let's check him out Yazid ibn Salam Sala, uh, Qaisar something Yazid ibn Salam uh, Qubbat al-Sakhra uh, I thought uh, some of you are uh, uh, Raja ibn Haywa so two Raja ibn Haywa and Yazid ibn Salam Raja ibn uh, Haywa and Yazid uh, ibn uh, Salam were the two architects who uh, uh, did the uh, building of the uh, uh, the whole of Masjid Al-Aqsa Mubarak. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them for the excellent work they have done. Coming to the Abbasid 217, 
after the Hijra, uh, the first time the name Al-Quds was used. Uh, during the Abbasids also we have um, this inclusive policy continuing on and uh, we have uh, particularly uh, the story of Abu Jafar al-Mansur uh, renovating al Masjid al-Aqsa because of an earthquake and also others who have renovated al Masjid al-Aqsa during the Abbasid period and Harun al-Rashid allowed the Christians to uh, renovate the churches and even allowed uh, Charlemagne uh, to build a hostel for Christian pilgrims coming into the city. The Abbasid Khalif al-Mahdi also came and uh, visited the city and renovated al-Masjid al-Aqsa and it was uh, uh, al-Ma'moon uh, who changed the name of the city from Bayt al-Maqdis to Al-Quds and even uh, Muslim travelers like Nasser Khisrov who came and visited the city a few centuries later was surprised that the people are using the name Al-Quds because he uh, talked about the name uh, Bayt al-Maqdis under the Fatimids, the Fatimids started in northern uh, uh, Africa and extended to Cairo and they built Cairo and built Al-Azhar to propagate Shia uh, doctrine and then they uh, extended their rule to Mecca, Medina and Bayt Al-Maqdis and uh, ruled there for around 90 uh, years. Uh, just before the Crusades, uh, the Seljuks and it was the anniversary of the uh, great battle of Malazgirt in 1071. 1071, Sunni Muslims, uh, namely the Seljuks, uh, and any of you watching Turkish series would know uh, the Seljuks were uh, powerful Sunni uh, rulers who started from, uh, started their major turning point was after the Battle of Malazkert uh, in Anatolia, in southern Turkey today, southern eastern Turkey today, and they managed to defeat the Byzantines and extend their rule across Bilad Sham and across the Muslim world, and uh, they were able to uh, uh, extend their rule uh, to Beit al-Maqdis. And during the Fatimid uh, period, uh, as I just mentioned earlier, uh, they were Shia and they persecuted the Sunni Muslims in Bayt al-Maqdis. And they didn't allow, uh, there was uh, uh, a lot of, uh, as al-Maqdisi who lived at that time talks about, he says about humiliation of Muslim Sunni scholars and not allowing, there was very few um, uh, circles of knowledge in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and uh, there were just a group of Hanafis reading from uh, a small uh, defter, a small booklet on Hanafi fiqh inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa but there was a problem uh, between the Shia uh, tradition at that time to be fair to them uh, other sciences uh, progressed in Bayt Al-Maqdis particularly medicine uh, and uh, pharmacy and chemistry and other things and there was many hospitals and so on but in terms of religious knowledge there was a lot of persecution on Muslim Sunni scholars because they didn't want uh, that to propagate they wanted Shia Islam to propagate within uh, the region and with the rise of the Seljuks they managed and particularly uh, the building of the schools the madrasas by Nizam al-Mulk and uh, scholars like Al-Ghazali and others joining in uh, to confront uh, uh, Baltini, Shia and other doctrines, they were able to establish uh, religious knowledge back in Bayt al-Maqdis uh, in a very strong way that uh, someone like Ibn al-Arabi would come, uh, he on his way to Hajj, uh, he stops in Bayt al-Maqdis and when he stops in Bayt al-Maqdis, he is shocked at the level of scholars gathering in Bayt al-Maqdis for knowledge. And uh, he uh, postpones his hajj for three years. And uh, instead of going to his hajj, he stops and takes knowledge from great scholars like Imam Tartushi and al-Maqdisi, other, another Maqdisi and other uh, scholars who hundreds uh, and this was a place where Muslims, Christians and Jews debated and uh, 
uh, even Muslim scholars debated and argued, and there were so many different groups on the subjects. Although the run of the subjects was relatively short, for about 30 years, uh, the subjects and the Artukids. Uh, however, uh, they managed to revive Islamic knowledge in Beit al Maqdis, and also cross religious uh, scholarship went on uh, for some time in, uh, in, in Beit al Maqdis. And this uh, uh, was uh, a very prosperous intellectual uh, time in, uh, in, in, in Beit al Maqdis. Uh, uh, with uh, the rise of the Crusades, and the Crusades were not out there just for religious reasons, although religion was used by the Crusaders uh, quite uh, in, in, in quite a strange uh, way, um, and they managed to uh, export a lot of the problems in Europe uh, across uh, so there was a lot of political problems, a lot of uh, uh, economic problems in Europe, and they managed to uh, uh, get out of that uh, by exporting this uh, with the rest of the uh, 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 export this to Beit al uh, I'm just asking to, uh, a lot of you are asking about the attendance form. Please share the attendance form uh, on YouTube. Uh, uh, so uh, those who are not in the WhatsApp group uh, can also join in uh, or fill in the, uh, the attendance form. Uh, so coming back, uh, uh, something quite interesting happened. There was an alliance between the Fatimids and the Crusades against the Seljuks. And Ibn al-Athir, in his history of Kamil al-Tariq, suggests that even the coming of the Crusades was uh, something that was uh, uh, liaised with the Fatimids. However, this theory seems to be far-fetched, and Dr. Maher Abu Mushar has a, an interesting paper. You can write uh, on Google Scholar, uh, Fatimids and the Crusades, foes uh, or allies, and he discusses this in some detail. But one Crusader uh, historian, William of Tyre, discusses that in ten, in eleven, uh, in ten ninety eight, uh, not eleven ninety eight, in ten ninety eight, the Crusaders were besieging the city of Antioch, and an embassy was sent from Cairo to meet with the Crusaders in Antioch and suggest to them the following, that we will attack the Seljuk Sunnis from the south, and you attack from the north, and we share their inheritance, we divide it amongst ourselves. Which is quite interesting, if anyone can tell us uh, why we, would they uh, do such a thing, that while they were besieging the city of Antioch, uh, my apologies, I haven't been able to find my English slides, so some of this is uh, in Arabic. So while they were besieging Antioch, they would uh, receive an embassy asking them to join forces and then uh, they, the Fatimids would attack from the south and they would attack from the north and they would share the properties amongst uh, themselves. Quite an interesting uh, su suggestion uh, by the, by the uh, Fatimids to the uh, Crusaders, uh, Mumtaz, to topple the Seljuks, they were uh, their rivals, as they controlled a lot of the lands. Yes, the Seljuks were quite strong, and they were fighting, uh, they were in constant struggle with the Fatimids, uh, even they tried to take uh, uh, Cairo and take Egypt, but they were not able to uh, do so, so they stopped in uh, Asfalan and in Gaza, uh, and they didn't proceed to Egypt after that. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the dates that we're mentioning, yes, they are in the common era. Uh, so we're talking about 1098, now 1099, the arrival of the Crusades. So actually, indeed, the Fatimids attacked from the south and the Crusaders came from the north and the infighting amongst Muslims uh, was the reason for the failure, even amongst the Seljuks themselves, unfortunately, and some of the Muslim Sunni rulers that were fight, in fighting uh, meant the uh, failure 
uh, of the uh, uh, and the fall of uh, Beit and Maqdis, the Crusaders uh, took uh, besieged the city, uh, <coughs> and uh, they besieged the city of Beit and Maqdis for forty days. And there is a lot of similarities between the Crusades and their atrocities and the Zionists. And there are many uh, comparisons written uh, uh, on uh, this issue, the comparison between the Crusades and the Zionist occupation uh, today. Uh, they besieged the city for 40 days. Uh, they attacked the city uh, until uh, the city fell. And with the fall of the city, uh, the people were massacred. The Crusaders came uh, from uh, the north, uh, west, and the also the southern area of the city. And uh, after uh, a long attack, uh, they managed to uh, enter the city from the north, and the uh, people hid inside uh, Al Masjid Al Aqsa to protect themselves. And 70,000, according to Ibn al-Athir, were slaughtered inside the Masjid al-Aqsa. Jews were slaughtered, uh, not slaughtered, they were burned down in their synagogue in the old city. They were set on fire and uh, the Muslims killed in the streets and those who escaped thinking that they are going to be in protection inside the Masjid al-Aqsa, a holy place, 70,000 of them were slaughtered according to Christian accounts, 20,000. So we're talking in tens of thousands, Muslims were slaughtered inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. However, the Crusader, uh, the Crusader uh, uh, slaughtered everyone with the exception of the Fatimid garrison who gathered in the, uh, in, they gathered inside the, uh, the citadel and uh, hiding inside the citadel uh, they uh, uh, were giving safe passage out of the city um, so uh, the crusader accounts i would suggest you would read the crusader accounts of the atrocities of the massacres that took place inside al masjid al-aqsa thanks for sharing the attendance form you can see the attendance form and you will be able to uh, uh, fill the attendance form uh, for uh, for today, um, inshallah, uh, as uh, Continuing on, uh, the Crusaders' uh, accounts of what happened inside the Masjid al-Aqsa is uh, unbelievable. They talked about uh, killing the young throwing off little infants from the wall of the Masjid al-Aqsa, uh, raping uh, elderly women inside the mosque. Uh, these are crusader accounts, uh, opening the guts of Muslims to search for gold. Um, uh, the, the, one crusader talks about if the, the atrocities that they have committed, they would uh, mention if they would uh, narrate what actually happened, it's beyond belief. And they were uh, savages in their attack and attacking people inside their holiest place was one of the uh, greatest uh, greatest atrocities that uh, took, uh, took place. Uh, the city uh, applied the law of conquest they would take uh, people's houses uh, properties uh, ethnically cleanse everyone in that city uh, as uh, they uh, occupied the city some people turned poor crusaders uh, who had nothing in europe now became uh, filthy rich by taking the houses and the properties of the Muslims that they have killed. A question, what do you think the Muslim world's response was? Do you think it is it was good, the Muslims responded, or was it bad and they were uh, passive and did nothing based on what we have learned so far? So if you write your comments, I'll be uh, grateful and we will continue our uh, discussion 
uh, based on your answers, inshallah. So on the 15th of July, 1099, uh, in the common calendar, uh, the city of Beit al-Maqdis fell. As I mentioned, the uh, Fatimid garrison were the only ones that uh, were saved. Also, interestingly, uh, the ulama, a group of the ulama, were not slaughtered by the crusaders. Uh, why do you think they didn't kill the ulama initially? And two, those who were in prison. So the, the people that were saved from the massacre were the Fatimid garrison, the Sunni Muslim ulama, and thirdly, uh, those who were in prison. Those in prison you know, during the time of the massacre, they were uh, uh, not found. So afterwards, they asked them to help in the clearing of the uh, bodies out of uh, the city, uh, and they burned them, they placed them on piles, uh, on a large pile, and then they burned them. They burned the Muslim uh, bodies after they had uh, killed them. Um, so some of the answers that are coming, yes, uh, passive. Uh, unfortunately, yes, a lot of the Muslim uh, leaders uh, were passive and uh, they didn't do much. Uh, and that is... Uh, uh, we will see what was the response of the Abbasid Khilafah, the Khalif, what was his response, and we will get into the uh, details. Actually, many of the Muslim rulers uh, uh, made uh, agreements with the Crusaders who were marching through their territory. As long as that they do not attack them, then they would allow them safe passage. So the Crusaders continued on... Uh, from Antioch, a few hundred kilometers away, all the way down to uh, Beit al-Maqdis without uh, real um, resistance. And not just the Fatimid, the Shia, but also Sunni uh, rulers, uh, unfortunately, uh, agreed, uh, agreed with them as they were, uh, uh, they have created uh, an agreement with them. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, a lot of the Muslim rulers were uh, not just passive, but also implicit in the occupation of Beit al-Maqdis, and they allowed this to happen. Um, so after they occupied Beit al-Maqdis, then they went on and they took um, uh, these uh, Muslim rulers and their territory uh, they took it from them uh, after uh, af afterwards. Uh, some uh, individuals, uh, like uh, Bano is suggesting, like the Artukids, actually did try to regain Beit al Maqdis at later times, about 40, 50 years later, but they were not successful. They even marched down from Mardin in southern Turkey today, Diyarbakir, and other places, and they tried to take back the city, but they were not uh, successful. Uh, the, at that time, uh, uh, some of the people who managed to survive the massacre in the city and managed to jump off the walls and they went to Damascus and uh, they told of the atrocities that took place. And Imam al-Harawi, the Imam of the Great Mosque in uh, Damascus, uh, said nothing will come from Damascus, let's go to Baghdad and meet with the Khalif. And the fall of Beit al-Maqdis took place in, on the uh, on the month of Shaban, middle of Shaban, 492 after the Hijra. So they marched from Damascus uh, with Imam al-Harawi, and they went to Baghdad, and they reached the month in the month of Ramadan. And people were indulging in uh, iftar programs. People were uh, living their lives uh, just like we are today while Al-Aqsa was under occupation. And uh, Imam al-Harawi went to the Great Mosque, actually went to meet the Khalif initially. And the Khalif was uh, uh, so busy with so many Ramadan iftars and programs, he was not uh, ready to meet uh, with them. They said, well, come later, he's busy. Uh, so he goes to the Great Mosque and uh, of Baghdad, 
uh, and uh, he meets with the ulama there and he tells them of what happened and trying to meet the khalif and the khalif is not willing to listen so they give him the opportunity to deliver the Jum'ah khutbah on uh, on uh, that uh, that week uh, so he climbs on the minbar to talk about what has happened in al-Masjid al-Aqsa and just looking at people's faces and being indifferent to what has happened he decides to something to do something very very interesting he decides instead of delivering the khutbah to break his fast in the month of Ramadan imagine how would you react to any man on the month of Ramadan instead of delivering the khutbah prayer the Juma uh, prayer he would inst instead uh, climb the member and break his fast what would your uh, uh, response be if you were in the audience listening to this imam instead of listening to the uh, khutbah of uh, juma he is breaking his fast and he invites the people who came with him from Beit al maqdis to break their fast also so they break their fast in the middle of the month of ramadan His, yes, shock. Everyone will be in shock. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, why would he do such a thing? And people fast, you know, Muslims are so good at uh, uh, giving names and uh, calling him uh, uh, a fasiq and saying that he is not a Muslim and how can he climb the member and this and that and what he said next was the actual shock uh, he said to regain al-masjid al-aqsa is more of a religious duty than praying and fasting in the month of Ramadan did you get what he is trying to do uh, to regain al-masjid al-aqsa is more of a religious duty than the month, than praying and fasting in the month of Ramadan. To shake the people that what has happened in Al Masjid Al Aqsa is something that Muslims need to act upon. Muslims cannot stay living their lives like nothing has happened. This is unacceptable for you to stay where you are, to do nothing while the Masjid al-Aqsa is under occupation, while the first Qibla is under occupation. And he wanted to shake the people uh, to understand the graveness of this. Many of you will say, well, he committed a grave sin by breaking his fast. And yes, he did. And in response, uh, he has to fast two months continuously as kafara for breaking his fast on the uh, day of uh, on the day uh, of Ramadan, so he's willing to do the kafara. But what, the question he's posing is, what is your kafara for Al Aqsa being under occupation and you doing nothing? You have no kafara to pay except the liberation of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, and this is why all the ulama in in in, in even today they say. Uh, to liberate Al Masjid Al Aqsa is Fard uh, Ain. It is an obligation. Uh, you know what Fard Ain is? It is a Fard Ain on every Muslim and Muslimah uh, to work for the liberation of Al Masjid Al Aqsa uh, Al Mubarak. And my apologies, my voice is breaking up a little bit. Uh, it seems like I'm coming down with a cold. I hope it is not uh, Corona. So please. Every now and then I have to drink. Uh, so now I'm drinking this uh, like paracetamol and something with it. So my apologies for every now and then drinking. Bismillah. And I'm drinking with my right hand, but it seems it's the image is mirrored. So it seems that I'm drinking with the left. So I drink with, with both hands. <clears throat> yes. Um, so what he tried to do is uh, to break 
this silence and the impotence of Muslims at that time that they're not willing to do anything. By the way, he got arrested for doing so. Uh, he gets arrested, thrown into prison, and then when the police understand what actually took place, uh, then they take him to the Khalif and he has a meeting with the Khalif. And when uh, they meet with the uh, Khalif, uh, something interesting happens. Uh, the poets stand and uh, give uh, poetry on what has taken place. And Imam al Harawi speaks in front of the Khalif. And the Khalif uh, uh, must have just had his iftar. He must have eaten a little bit too much. And he wasn't getting himself emotional enough to... This is recorded, unfortunately, in the books of history. And he wasn't getting his, himself to cry. So he asks for water to make wudu. And what he does is he does the following. He takes water places it on his face to pretend that he was uh, getting affected and he's uh, actually crying uh, from what was uh, happening. And uh, that is uh, the situation of the Muslims uh, and what took place uh, during the, uh, that period. The Khalif uh, says we do not have an army here in Baghdad. We have to ask people for help. We, Imam al-Harawi, I summon you to go to the different cities and raise Mujahideen to come and join uh, the army uh, for the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis. And Imam al-Harawi travels city to city, from place to place, raising people, telling them on what has happened and trying to get them uh, to come and fight uh, for the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis. Uh, unfortunately, he was assassinated uh, in this process. Uh, and uh, the biggest role for the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis actually was taken, the foundation for the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis was taken by the ulama. The ulama took it upon their shoulders uh, to uh, tell people of the importance of al-Masjid al-Aqsa and the importance of jihad. Someone like Imam Sulami, and I suggest that you read Imam Sulami's Kitab al-Jihad. Imam Sulami writes a book, and part of the book survived, and part of it is not. In the book al-Jihad, he talks about the importance of jihad in Islam and why people need to be uh, always uh, on uh, guard uh, and only when the Muslims have left jihad, then they have become uh, uh, pathetic uh, uh, losers in this world, and will, there will be losers in the hereafter. Uh, so not just Imam Sulami, but other scholars. But Imam Sulami did something interesting. He covered the importance of al-Masjid al-Aqsa and Bayt al-Maqdis, and also covered the importance of jihad. So it was two important topics that people need to be uh, aware of the importance of jihad on one side and the importance of Bayt al-Maqdis. Because without knowing the importance of Bayt al-Maqdis, you will not be able to take steps for the uh, liberation of this land. And uh, that was the role that was taken by the ulama for the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis, raising the awareness initially. Uh, and this took some time until we have now uh, a leader willing to take this on board. And he was uh, Imaduddin uh, Zinki. Uh, Imaduddin Zinki was a, uh, uh, a Turkish commander uh, of Turkmen origin, and he was uh, willing to listen to the ulama on the importance of jihad, and particularly making jihad against the crusaders. So it was Imaduddin Zinki that started uh, a campaign against the Crusader. A strategy was devised by his son, uh, Nur al-Din Zinki, and then Salah al-Din, and then we'll come to the whole discussion. So Imad al-Din, uh, the son of Aksunkur, uh, he was um, uh, only uh, about 15 years old when Al-Masjid al-Aqsa was occupied. 
and he was the first Muslim leader to fight the Crusaders and to start a real strategy for the reconquest of Islamic Jerusalem and Beit al-Maqdis. And what he did is he took uh, the first Crusader uh, county, uh, Edessa, uh, in 1144. So 45 years after the Crusaders have occupied this land, the first real uh, 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 Muslim leader to fight them was Imaduddin Zinki. And Imaduddin Zinki uh, managed, uh, while the Crusaders were uh, hoping to advi uh, advance and to take even more lands, he stopped them in Orfa and he managed to uh, take that county, uh, the, the place of Orfa or Edessa, back from them uh, uh, 40 uh, five years after its occupation, and that was a very big blow to the uh, Crusaders. He was also assassinated during the siege of Jabr, uh, a Muslim citadel, while he was uh, besieging that place to take it. He was assassinated uh, while he was asleep uh, in his tent. He was killed, and uh, the uh, Zinki uh, state continued by his son, and his son was way better even than his father. Uh, Nur al-Din Mahmoud, uh, by the way, in this period, people have um, uh, names uh, and titles, and also something like nicknames. So uh, Imad al uh, is his title, Nur al-Din is his title. Salah al-Din's real name isn't Salah al-Din, nor is Nur al-Din's real name Nur al-Din. Uh, Nur al-Din, his name was Mahmoud. Does anyone know what was the real name of Salah al-Din? Uh, his nickname or his title was Salah al-Din. But what was his actual name? Let's see if someone actually uh, knows. Uh, so until that answer comes, we will continue. Uh, Mahmoud Nur al-Din uh, Zinki. Uh, he was known as the uh, Al Malik Al Adil, the just king, and he was. And he was known also as a Shaheed, uh, although he died on his uh, bed. He didn't die on the battlefield, but he was known as the Shaheed. And I will explain why he was known as the Shaheed. Yes, thank you to those who gave the right answer. Uh, starting with Nurhan. Salah al-Din's real name was Yusuf. Uh, and uh, Yusuf ibn uh, Ayyub uh, was the actual name of uh, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Uh, and his title was Salah al-Din. Nur al-Din Zinki, he's the one that placed the strategy for the liberation of Beit al-Maqdis. His father worked against the Crusades. Uh, and had a strategy fighting the crusade, but his son, um, Nur al-Din Mahmoud, uh, he devised a strategy uh, for the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa based on the strategy of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was ruling Aleppo, and he ruled from Aleppo after the assassination of his father, Himad al-Din, and made it for his, ba uh, his base for uh, uh, his uh, fight against the uh, crusade. He destroyed and managed to stop the second crusader campaign, which managed to take, uh, wanted to take Damascus. And he managed to unite all of Syria, with the exception of Beit al-Maqdis and Palestine, which was under the, uh, or the lands that were under crusader occupation. The rest of the Muslims, he aimed, one of his aim was to unite the Muslims together and he built lots of madrasas, he had lots of important education uh, strategies for the liberation of Beit al-Maqdis during his time. Books on the Fadail of Beit al-Maqdis were being taught, and the importance of Beit al-Maqdis and Masjid al-Aqsa was uh, something that he uh, promoted. In addition to a lot of the things that we have learned, spiritual, religious, political, uh, and uh, even preparing a gift for the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, we see that Nur al-Din Zinki also did exactly the same. And we will get into some of uh, what he has done. 
the road to al-Masjid al-Aqsa uh, where of three, his strategy was based on three things or three steps. The first was based on knowledge, uh, which is uh, important for us even today. That the um, uh, knowledge is extremely important. So that's why he built lots of madrasas uh, and uh, other things that he managed to uh, build uh, for uh, for that, and books were being written on the importance of Bayt al Maqdis and so on, as we have mentioned earlier. The second, the uh, so knowledge actually entails uh, the various different things that we have discussed: uh, spiritual, religious, and so on. And if we look at what he has actually done, uh, we see all of this being reflected in the life of Nuruddin Zinki. Uh, but something that he had to do that wasn't the case at the time of the Prophet وسلم, was uniting the Muslims. The Muslims were so divided, each one had a mini city-state uh, fighting against one another, and Nur al-Din Zinki tried to win the Muslims over by trying to do various different things, uh, by trying to do uh, uh, things um, in, in many different ways, uh, uh, trying to win them over uh, without fighting with good words. Uh, many of them, that's, that doesn't buy them anything. So even marrying the daughter of the ruler of, um, of Damascus, so he can win him over that we're on the same side. And this was a policy that was followed at that, uh, at that time. Uh, the second uh, that uh, thing he did is sometimes he would fight the Muslims in order to unite the Muslims under one banner. And he achieved unity of the Muslims across Syria. And when he achieved that, then uh, he sent uh, his uh, army general, uh, excuse me, the uncle of Salah al-Din, Asad al-Din, Sherko, uh, he sent him off to Egypt in order to, to unite the two realms of Islam, Egypt and Bilad al-Sham. Without them, the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis would not be possible. So he looked at this on both sides. You need to unite the Muslims on both sides, on the side of Bilad al-Sham and on the side of Egypt. And even today, uh, without the liberation of Egypt and Syria from the tyrants that are ruling there, uh, the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis will not be possible. Uh, so this is quite important, and if you'd like to read more on this, read on the Baraka Circle Theory of Bayt al-Maqdis, which discusses the importance of uh, the uh, Syrian, Bilad al-Sham, and the Egyptian side, and the center of power is actually Egypt. And that's why we will come to discussing Egypt in uh, a little while, and what Salah al has achieved. So the third step will be the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Mubar, but this comes after the Fath of knowledge and after the unity of the Muslim is achieved, then the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa will be just a matter of time. Uh, during the time of Nur al-Din Zinki, he tried to do this with the Muslims and unfortunately uh, he managed to achieve so much and he was not able to achieve it all in his uh, life. And it, it was Salah al-Din that continued the, uh, on the path of his teacher, Nur al-Din Mahmoud, in, in terms of the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis and the liberation of the whole of the land from the uh, Crusader uh, occupation. And what you see here, Salah al-Din was born in uh, uh, about... Uh, 30, 40 years after the occupation of Bayt al-Maqdis, many of you are born uh, in uh, after al-Masjid al-Aqsa was occupied, but it's something that we need to live upon. Salah al-Din lived during the Second Crusade uh, while he was with his father in, in Syria and saw how Nur al-Din managed to defeat them. And then Salah al-Din works uh, as his uncle's deputy and then becomes lieutenant in Egypt, and we will discuss a little bit of his uh, life. 
being born close to 40 years after the occupation of Beit al-Maqdis, he starts his uh, life in the army with his uncle. Uh, uh, his career uh, as uh, a soldier, uh, and then becomes the wazir of Egypt. Uh, and uh, becoming the wazir of Egypt becomes Beit al-Maqdis. Until that was not central to Salah al-Din's life. And he even says this himself. Actually, after the uh, uh, he becomes the wazir of Egypt, then Beit al-Maqdis becomes an important, uh, a central point in his life. And there is an article by Faris Glob in the Journal of Islamic Jerusalem Studies, which discusses how Salah al-Din, uh, Beit al-Maqdis became his uh, central point in his life even in the words of Salah al-Din uh, himself. Then later he becomes the Sultan of Egypt. And uh, at that time, his uh, mentor, uh, teacher, Nur al-Din Zinke has passed away. So uniting Egypt with Syria was took much more difficult uh, times. Salah al-Din, when he becomes, uh, actually, Salah al-Din did, did not want to go to Egypt with his uncle, uh, Asad al-Din Sherko. And uh, in the army of Nur al-Din, when Nur al-Din sent it over, and he, Egypt, he didn't want to go. Life was good in uh, in Syria. Why should I go there? Uh, and his uncle, as al -Din, took him by force. He took him forcefully, and then uh, it became quite uh, interesting in the life of Salah al-Din. And I'm going to quote directly from Salah al-Din. Uh, when he becomes first, his uncle becomes the Grand Wazir of Egypt. Uh, and then his uncle dies. And then the Fatimid Khalif, so this was under the Fatimid Khilafa, the Fatimid Khalif chooses Salah al-Din because he was an inexperienced. He thought that this young boy, he was at that time 30 years old, uh, this young boy, he can manage to manipulate him and to uh, have him under his control. Uh, so that's why he chose Salah al-Din to be the wazir. And Salah al-Din says, when Allah uh, chose me uh, and uh, made things easy for me in the Egyptian land, I knew that Allah wanted me to liberate the coastal area and Beit al-Maqdis because Allah put that in my heart. Uh, so when Allah enabled me to gain Egypt, I realized that he was, uh, he willed that the conquest of the Syrian coast and the Holy Land, uh, uh, he, Allah willed it for me because he put that idea in my mind and in my, uh, in my heart. And when Salah al-Din Ibn Shaddad says, when Salah al-Din after his uncle passes away, he uh, becomes uh, in power in Egypt. Uh, Salah al-Din leaves all things that distract him, all uh, matters of entertainment, everything. He leaves it all aside, and then he wears the garments of jid and ishtihad seriousness until he passes away. Uh, and he says, I heard directly from Salah al-Din uh, the statement that I just read in front of you. But what is interesting is also Ibn Shaddad says when the Crusaders knew that uh, uh, the Muslims uh, are uh, getting behind Salah in Egypt, they knew that he's going to take their land, uh, the land that they have occupied, and he will uh, uh, expel them and uh, uproot them from that as he's getting stronger. So the uh, Franks, the Crusaders, uh, uh, met and aimed to attack Egypt and uh, occupy it. And they uh, headed towards uh, Dimyata uh, from both land and sea. This is quite interesting because it brings, uh, uh, as one of you said earlier, um, uh, history repeats itself, and we will come into this, but uh, the sick Grand Master of the Knight Templar says his greatest fear was that a single Muslim prince, Emir, would reunite two most powerful realms, 
of Islam, Cairo and Damascus, and abolish the very name of Christian. So that, uh, the Crusaders were aware of the power of Damascus and Cairo, and they tried in the Second Crusade to take um, uh, with, uh, uh, Damascus, and now when Salah al-Din takes Egypt, now they head towards the occupation of Egypt. And what happens next is quite interesting. Salah al-Din went back and forth with his uncle to, to uh, Egypt, but now we are, Salah al-Din became, uh, uh, going back to the map, uh, sorry, the timeline of Salah al-Din, uh, Salah al-Din becomes the lieutenant in Egypt in the early 1160s. And now in 1169, the crusaders come from Beit al by uh, sea and by, uh, you can see here, the Byzantine navy even joins in. Uh, and uh, by land, they come uh, to Dimyat. And Salah al-Din is besieged in that place. And actually, it was going to be a very difficult battle. And Salah al-Din uh, in the besieged uh, city, he nearly lost everything. The Muslims were in a very difficult position in Dimyat uh, in 1169. And uh, the Muslims uh, were starving. Uh, and it's uh, if you read Ibn al-Athir and uh, Ibn Kathir and Ibn Shaddad, and others, what happened in the Miata just reminds you of what happened to the Muslims in Al Khandaq, in the Battle of the Trench. Uh, they were besieged, uh, no food, uh, getting out, running out of water. Uh, they were in a very difficult position, and uh, it got to a point that people were eating cats on the streets, uh, nothing to eat, and they were in despair. That's it. The fall of Dimyata will mean the fall of Egypt, uh, the fall of Cairo, and the fall of the rest of Egypt. And they were in a very, very difficult position. And what happens next uh, is not. Allah wants you to do everything in your hands, everything that you're capable of, to do it to the maximum of your ability. If you are able to achieve that, then the help of Allah will come. In uh, the day of the trench on Al-Khandaq, when the Prophet ﷺ was besieged by 10,000 people, the people were in despair. The Quran describes it. وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ The hearts came to the throats. وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ هُنَالِكَ زُلْزِيَ الْمُونَ You start to think, is Allah's help going to come? Even in the Quran, uh, Allah says, the, the people will say, and the prophets will say, مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهِ when will the victory of Allah come? And uh, we are still not even at that stage. We're still far away from that. It will become so desperate that people will, uh, as Allah says, I'm hasibtu. Do you think that you will not be tested uh, so that Allah will know those who are truthful from those who are not? Uh, it was very, very, very difficult uh, for the Muslims for Salah al-Din uh, being besieged and uh, Salah al-Din plays a trick on the Crusaders. He gathers, they send an embassy and Salah al-Din says, we can survive like this for uh, a year and we have enough food and water. And he puts a banquet of all the food in the city. Uh, he gathers it all to show that we're, you know, you can besiege us for another uh, for months and will still resist. And uh, they are, they've been besieging the city for a long time. They're not able to take it. And eventually they decide uh, after the help of Allah comes in the form of wind. This is quite interesting. That's why I said the resemblance with the uh, battle of the Khandaq. Uh, the wind that came uh, destroyed the ships of the Crusaders. They sank and they had to withdraw and go back to uh, where they came. And that uh, changed the dynamics of the story. And Salah al-Din then manages to uh, get back 
on the preparation for the liberation of Beit al-Maqdis. Something similar happened, um, but we'll discuss the similarity with today in uh, in a little uh, in a little while. Uh, Salah al-Din, uh, uh, as as we said, the preparation of knowledge was continuing, uh, trying to unite the Muslims under one ban banner: Egypt, North Africa, Yemen, Syria, Northern Iraq. Salah al-Din. Uh, it took him a long time to unite the Muslims. And what you see here in the map in red is the area that Salah al-Din united under the banner of Islam. But this was after his mentor, Nur al-Din, had passed away. And it took him to unite the Muslims under one banner more than it took him to fight the Crusades. Bear this in mind. Salah al-Din took him Egypt uh, alone. It took him five to seven years to get things in place uh, to uh, to get things uh, in 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 order, uh, but I'll mention to you something quite interesting. Um, when Salah al-Din, Nur al-Din kept writing to Salah al-Din that we need to end the fighting with Khilaf. They are one of the burdens on the Muslims. Without getting rid rid of the Fatimid Khilaf. Having two heads to the Muslim Ummah is not acceptable. We need to have it all under the Khilafah in Baghdad, at least uh, have the Muslims under one banner. That's one. End the Fatimid Khilafah and bring it under the same uh, rule. Uh, and Salah al uh, things were quite uh, not settled in Egypt, so he delayed this as much as he can. And then Nur al-Din got upset with Salah al-Din because Salah al-Din was delaying this a bit too much. And he sent uh, uh, an imam to call uh, in the khutbah uh, of the Juma prayer to make dua for the Khalif in Baghdad. This symbolic gesture was the idea of uniting the Muslims under one banner. Uh, they're not split. They were all under one banner, and now we can fight side by side. On that same day, the Khalif uh, passed away, uh, the Fatimid Khalif. So Salah al-Din took the chance and ended the Fatimid Khilafah. So now there is no more Fatimid Khilafah. All of the Muslims are under, under one banner. You don't have two hands. However, when Salah al-Din announced the end of the Fatimid Khilafah, many of the people who were uh, beneficiaries of the Fatimids uh, were not too happy. And they attempted a coup against Salah al-Din. Uh, very interesting. They attempted a coup. Does that remind you of Egypt just a few years ago? Uh, so uh, what happened is they attempted a coup. In the process, actually, amongst them are uh, Shia ulama, those who were ministers, those who were benefiting from the Fatimid Khilafah. Not only that, uh, Sunni ulama were amongst them preparing for the uh, coup against Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. And one of these ulama comes to Salah al-Din and he says, uh, I am sorry, but I am part of uh, the coup that will get rid of you. And I came here to warn you that Allah has saved us from the Fatimids and now we are planning to get them back. Uh, uh, what... Uh, what shall I do? This is the people involved in the coup. This is what they will do. This is the, the, the details. Salah al-Din says, go back and continue preparing the coup. What? Why would Salah al-Din send him back to continue preparing for the coup against Salah al-Din? Salah al-Din wanted to have a spy amongst them uh, to see their full plan. So this alim went back and continued until uh, time to strike. Uh, he comes to Salah al-Din and he says to him, now they are going to do this tomorrow at this time. And Salah al-Din uh, gathers his men and his army and uh, surrounds them in their headquarter and takes all of them and places their heads at, he kills all of them and places their heads at the gates of Cairo. Salah al-Din, by doing this, managed to end this rebellion, but it started a second rebellion of, from the Sudan with 50,000 slaves who were one of the 
people that he killed, Muqtaman al-Khilaf al-Fatimi, uh, he was, he owned 50,000 slaves that he had prepared to uh, ransack Cairo if he gets killed. So they do, they do that and Salah al nearly loses everything uh, in, uh, in, in Egypt, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, uh, strengthened him to be able to uh, finish them, uh, finish them off. Uh, a resemblance in modern history is uh, Muhammad Morsi in Egypt. When he becomes the uh, president of Egypt, many people are not happy, particularly the Zionist state. And the Zionist state, learning from the Crusades, by the way, a lot of centers for studying the Crusades exist, and a lot of researchers, uh, Zionist uh, Israeli uh, researchers, are studying the Crusades in a lot of detail because it resembles them. The Crusades were a foreign entity in the heart of Muslim land. By understanding the mistakes of the Crusades, you are able to uh, try to uh, not make the same mistakes. And they learned, they knew that when Muhammad Morsi came into power in Egypt, that this would be the end of the Zionist state. Uh, okay. So what would they do? Send an army to Egypt? No, they learned from the Crusades. They send their man, someone they have planted well before, and I will come to that in, in, in a little while. Uh, but what's interesting on this example is that Muhammad Morsi was told of exactly what Salah al-Din was told uh, 900 years ago. He was told they're preparing a coup against you. And Salah, uh, no, um, Muhammad Morsi, may Allah forgive him and have mercy on him and accept his shahada. He comes on TV and he says, our soldiers are the best men of gold. Uh, and he brushes these ideas off. And then he was suggested, and this was told to us by one of his advisors. He was told, uh, uh, put a spy amongst them, put a spy in the army so he can follow what is happening and let you know and he says spying in islam is haram and had we known of the example of salah Din, that's why learning history is extremely important and the zionists know this but we do not uh, had we known of this had muhammad morsi may allah have mercy on his soul knew this he would have learned from the example of salah Din and managed to stop them in their tracks before attempting the coup. Unfortunately, the, two, the coup in Egypt was successful and the first democratically elected president of Egypt was thrown in prison and later died in, in, in prison. May Allah have mercy on him. Uh, going back to the example of Salah al-Din, Salah al-Din uh, settles the issue of Egypt and in that process, uh, Nur al-Din Zinki uh, they plan an attack on the Crusades. And while he was coming uh, to Karak, which was one of the uh, uh, strongholds of the Crusaders, his father falls ill, so Salah al -Din retracts back to Cairo because he was afraid that uh, something else could happen. Uh, then Nur al-Din Zinki passes away. And in that uh, in, uh, by the way, Nur al-Din Zinki, if you do not know much about him, he is the most important figure in the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and Bayt Al-Maqdis. He's the one that put the strategy for the liberation. He's the one that united the Muslims. He's the one that sent Salah al-Din to Egypt with his uncle. He's the one that prepared the whole road. Even he built the minbar for the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He built the mihrab. So he built the minbar. It took 20 years to build one single pulpit, minbar, which uh, was placed in Al Masjid Al Aqsa after the liberation by Salah al Din. He created the mihrab known as the mihrab uh, in Aleppo, the mihrab of uh, Al Quds in Aleppo, where dua will be made for Al Masjid Al Aqsa. The minbar was there, no khutbah is to be delivered except in Al Masjid Al Aqsa uh, and Al Mubarak. He was connected to al-Masjid al-Aqsa in so many different ways. He'd fight the crusaders, and as he says in his own words, he nafsi I would place myself out there for shahada. 
So he would fight asking Allah to accept him as Shaheed, and that's why he's known as Muhammad Nuruddin as Shaheed, although he died on his bed, because all his life he fought against the uh, Crusaders and uh, made jihad against them. Uh, so he's a very interesting uh, figure. If you do not know, he's very righteous. Uh, 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 even some scholars call him the sixth Khalif, after the four Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and the fifth uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, they call him the sixth guidely, rightly guided Khalif because he was such a righteous ruler and leader. And there are so many stories of him uh, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah accepting his dua. He's the one known that he would not smile while the Muslims were under siege. Uh, the story is told about Salah Din, but actually the story is from his mentor, Nuruddin Mahmoud, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. And in Harim, in so many different places, he fought against the Crusaders, and even he had in his uh, prison uh, one of their uh, kings. Uh, Salah al-Din Ayyubi, after the death of his teacher, Nuruddin Zinki, Bilad al-Sham, Iraq, and uh, Anatolia became divided again. Uh, they were united under Nuruddin. Now Salah al-Din has to travel to Damascus. So Salah al-Din with 700 men takes them from Cairo, goes to Damascus, takes Damascus with 700 men. People open the doors. But Homs and Halab, Aleppo were so difficult. So was Musab. The most two difficult cities in the life of Salah al-Din were Mosul and Aleppo. And Salah al-Din would fight against the people of Aleppo. He would fight against them, take the prisoners. He would win, take them prisoners, and then gather them all, kill them. No. Instead, Salah al-Din would give them gifts and tell them, our enemies won. Let's fight together. We would go back into the citadel, prepare another army, and fight Salah al-Din again. Salah al-Din spent 14 years, seven in Egypt, we mentioned, and another 14 years in Syria, in Bilad al-Sham, to try to unite the Muslims. Our problem is not with the occupiers. Our problem is with the Muslims who are not united. And this we learn from Nur al-Din and from Salah al-Din Ayyubi. And I hope this is uh, uh, clear uh, for, uh, for you uh, listening uh, to us. And you can see the life of Salah al-Din from taking control of Egypt in 1174 until the liberation of al-Masjid al-Aqsa, you can see it takes uh, years uh, for this to be uh, fulfilled. Uh, from Salah al-Din becoming the lieutenant in Egypt uh, in 1164. Uh, let me make the screen a little bigger so you can see this a little uh, cleaner, uh, sorry, clearer. Uh, until the liberation of uh, Al Masjid Al Aqsa in 1178, it took Salah al Din uh, uh, 14 years uh, to be able to achieve, uh, achieve this, uh, uniting the Muslims under one, uh, one uh, banner. Uh, and you can see Salah al Din went westwards, uh, he went towards uh, Tunisia and Libya, he went south, south, southwards uh, towards uh, Sudan. He went, he sent his brother to Yemen. Uh, uniting the Muslims under one banner was extremely important for the liberation of Beit al -Maktis. And uh, you need to bear this in mind that uh, do not think, this is another lesson for all of you, and for all of us, that do not think that the issue of uh, differences amongst the Muslims get over small differences. We, as Muslims, agree on 97% of things in terms of fiqh, in terms of whatever you talk about, we agree nearly on everything. But we blow out the three percent to make them. Uh, Muslims will disagree on everything, unfortunately, uh, on poli in politics, in fiqh, in whatever, in aqid, in whatever you want. But two mu'min will not disagree on the issue of Bayt al maqdis and the importance of al-Masjid al-Aqsa. And this is what Salah al-Din and Nur al-Din Zinki capitalized on, is to unite the Muslims around the a common goal that everyone agrees on. Get over differences. Get over, uh, they, they will never, these differences are not, never going to go away. But you need to get over this and think for the bigger uh, issue of 
the Muslim Ummah, uh, going back to Imam al-Harawi, Imam al-Harawi wanted to sh shake the Muslim Ummah by saying, wake up, wake up, what are you doing? While Al-Aqsa is uh, under occupation, this is to liberate it is a great farad on every Muslim. And today Muslim scholars say exactly the same thing. You know what farad ayn means? That uh, uh, it is an obligation. It is a personal obligation on every Muslim uh, male and female, the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and the liberation of uh, Bayt, uh, Bayt Al-Maqdis. Salah uh, al-Din goes today, today southern Turkey. Uh, you see it here on the map. Let me zoom in so you can see it a little uh, clearer. So Salah al-Din is north of Aleppo. You can see here where the uh, two dots are. Uh, and Salah al-Din is in Harran today close to Urfa. He goes to Mardin. Mardin is on a mountain, difficult to uh, take. He was in, in, in Diyarbakir, southern Turkey today. He goes to Mosul. He besieges Mosul a few, uh, a few uh, times and he's not successful. And his aim is to liberate, uh, to unite the Muslims under one banner. You know what the Muslims do? They uh, pay the assassins. And you know who are the Hashashin, the assassins. Uh, they're known, uh, many of you might know them from Assassin's Creed, uh, the game. But the Assassins, or uh, Hassan Sabah and his men, uh, Hashashin, they pay them to go and kill Salah al -Din with gold. And Salah al -Din, uh, while he was in his tent sleeping, uh, feels the presence of someone in his tent, and he feels the knife on the throat of Salah al-Din. Salah al -Din says he doesn't know where the strength came to him from Allah. He managed to overpower the attacker and uh, kill him. Uh, Muslims are paying for the killing of Salah al-Din. This is not once, twice, three times, four times attempting. Putting their hands in the hands of the crusaders to fight Salah al-Din. Uh, does this remind you of... Uh, Anything today? Uh, again, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, many states normalizing with the Zionist state, uh, their enemy normalizing relations uh, against the Muslims in Palestine. And you see how clearly uh, many of these states are even in, not just uh, uh, supporting the occupation, but they're also complicit in the uh, siege on Gaza, for example. E Egypt is... Uh, uh, Gaza has three borders with the Zionists, one with the sea, which they also control, as we saw with the Mavi Marmar. But they side with Egypt. The uh, current uh, president, uh, the one that attempted the coup of Egypt, uh, illegitimate president of Egypt, Sisi, who is supported by the Zionists. They never paid for the PR of anyone except for Sisi after the coup to, in order to do his PR in the United States. The Zionist, on the day that he did the coup, uh, in the front pages, Sisi, the hero of Israel. Uh, this man, uh, even more than Hosni Mubarak, he has created uh, an iron wall underground to stop the tunnels. Uh, going into uh, Gaza and besieging Gaza even more than the, Z the uh, Zionists and even more than Hosni Mubarak uh, was, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, states normalizing with this Zionist state, wallahi, will not bring them any benefit. Uh, no one will benefit from the Zionists. They will benefit. Uh, the benefit all will go back uh, to them. Um, and we see this today, and at that time, we have the examples of those who put their hands in the hands of the, the, the crusaders, and when they fell, the crusaders didn't even uh, pay any respect uh, to them. Even those who ran off to the crusades after they had served them. Uh, you know, we have a saying in Palestine, uh, uh, a spy or a servant of uh, uh, the Zionists, after they finish with him, like a mop, 
you know, after you finish mopping the ground and after the mop is so dirty, then you throw it in the bin. Uh, and that's the case for all these uh, so-called Muslim leaders. After that, uh, they will uh, they will uh, get get to that uh, get to that level. They'll be thrown in the dustbins of uh, not just uh, the Zionists, but the dustbins of history. Uh, so going back to Salah uh, attempts on his assassination, and Salah every time Allah saves him from an assassination, he turns around and he says, Allah has not saved me except to liberate the Masjid al-Aqsa. You can see this clearly in the mind of Salah that he focuses all his energy towards this. And then Salah falls ill in Haran and he swears immediately after Allah gives him shifa, he will directly march to, to that place and he manages to take Aleppo uh, and he manages to neutralize Mosul. Uh, all he wanted from Mosul, and this was the agreement with the people of Mosul and the leader of Mosul, is that when I ask you for help, please send the army. That's all I want from you. You can stay the emir of Mosul, or I do not want to be in your position. Uh, all I want is when I call on you, please send the Muslim army. Uh, and that's what Salah Adin achieves after 14 years, uniting the Muslims under one banner, they understand what he wants, and now Salah al-Din marches to uh, fight the Crusades. But before that, there's a very interesting story you need to know. The Crusaders, have you heard of uh, Renaud de Chatillon or Arnaud? Anyone have heard of him? He was a Crusader prince. And he, had, he was very ambitious. Actually, he was in the prison of Nur al-Din for a very long time, but after he was released, after the death of Nur al-Din, he marries the uh, uh, princess of Karak, and then he becomes the uh, ruler of Karak. Yes. What he does is he decides, and I will show you this, let's take a line and show you exactly what he does. He attacks the Muslims going on Hajj. So while people are going to Hajj, they pass by his, uh, I cannot use the, this color, I need to use a different color. Uh, so he, while people are going on Hajj, he attacks their caravans. So he is based here in Karak, and then he attacks the caravans going to Hajj, and he uh, takes their gold and uh, kills the Muslims. What he does while Salah al -Din was in the north, while Salah al -Din was here, he decides that he's going to go to, uh, he goes to the port of Aqaba, Ayla, and then takes the ship down the Red Sea and then reaches Yenba. And does anyone know what his aim was? Yes, he was an evil man. Uh, he was a cruel man. Uh, uh, what does he uh, aim to do? What does he want to do? He, with the help of some Bedouins, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Al-A'rabu ashaddu kufran wa nifaqa wa ajdaw alla ya'lamu hududa ma anzal Allah. Some of the Bedouins, uh, and we see some of them today uh, in positions of leadership, uh, are... Uh, the most Arab uh, um, Does anyone know this verse? Uh, can someone please write it? Uh, uh, or write the English translation uh, of it. It is in Surah at Tawbah, verse 97. Uh, Tawbah, verse 97, uh, discusses the uh, uh, this this issue. It says. Uh, Al-Arab, the nomadic Arabs, uh, are worse in, the, in disbelief and hypocrisy and less likely to know the laws revealed by Allah and his messenger. Do not see this as all uh, Bedouins or all Arabs because the next verse, uh, uh, verse 99 of Surah At-Tawbah says, and amongst them are those who believe in Allah and the Day of Judgment and consider what they uh, donate as a means of coming closer to Allah. 
and they are great uh, Muslims, but it is here uh, talking about uh, them in general, and then the Quran specifies uh, in verse 99 that not all of them, but we're talking about the corrupt ones, the, the ones that uh, are full of nifaq and uh, hypocrisy, and they only uh, accept Islam because Islam is strong, and they have to do it, but in reality, they're not real uh, Muslims. They are more of a danger than the disbelievers. And the Quran warns, warns so much uh, of, uh, of, of that. The, uh, um, uh, what happens is that he wanted to uh, not destroy Muhammad Aqeel, not destroy the Prophet's uh, mosque, but he wanted to go to Medina take the body of the Prophet وسلم, and take it back to Carrick and then take it to France. I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but he was uh, uh, Renault Chatillon, uh, the uh, originally French uh, um, crusader knight. Uh, decided to do this and he gets so close by the way he with the support of these Arab they reach close to Medina Salah al-Din was so far away over a thousand kilometers away if you were in the position of Salah al-Din what would you have done would you have left everything and marched down to stop him from attacking Medina uh, and how would you do this um, let's see, if you were in the position of Salah al-Din, this man wants to dig out the grave of the Prophet وسلم, take his body back, and by the way, he was doing it for a business, he had a business mind, why, he used to kill the Muslims going to Hajj, and he used to ask them, why are you going there, why do you go to Mecca and Medina, and they say to Mecca, to the house of Allah and Medina, to visit the Prophet Sallallahu he thought, well, if I take uh, if I take the body of the Prophet, now the Muslims come to visit him, they have to pay me tax. Uh, so this is this is the man thinking in that uh, uh, on 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 that to do. Salah al-Din, they wanted to divert him from the mission that Salah al-Din was on, was uh, to unite the Muslims against the Crusaders. Salah al-Din does not leave Haran or the place that he's in. Instead, Salah al-Din sends a tweet. Do you know Twitter at the time of Salah al-Din existed? Anyone knows that Twitter existed at the time of Salah al-Din? But in a different form. How did he send the message, uh, Mumtaz? Mumtaz is Mumtaz. He is uh, spot on. No, he didn't send his son. Uh, yes, thank you, Sauda. Uh, spot on also. Uh, yes, he uh, used uh, carrier pigeons to send a message to his new fleet that he has built, uh, created in Egypt. They went down on the Red Sea and then they stopped him just outside Medina. He was so close to digging up the grave of the Prophet And Salah al-Din sent his leader, not al-Afdal, but he sent his uh, leader, Hussam al-Din Lu'lu. Hussam al-Din Lu'lu took him, Salah al-Din commanded him not to kill Rinal de Shatyun, because Salah al-Din wanted to kill Rinal de Shatyun himself. He swore to Allah after he attacked the pilgrims and after he did this he said i swear by allah i will take him i will kill him on my own on the way back while they were taking him to salah al-din he manages to get away and escape imprisonment and salah al-din uh, swears again that he will take uh, uh he will take uh, he will kill him by his own hands and we will come to what salah al-din did after that salah al-din now uniting the muslims he calls all the Muslims to come and gather uh, close to Tabari. And Salah al-Din raises the Muslims. They come from all over. They come from uh, 
the Kurdish areas, they come from uh, today places in Turkey, they come from Syria, they come from Egypt, and all of them under the leadership of his brother Al Adil, they come from Egypt, and they are gathered in uh, close to Tiberius. Salah al Din, as a military strategist, he, the Crusaders, were far away, about 30 kilometers away. And Salah al Din wanted to bring them to his playground. So Salah al Din decides the time and decides the place where the battle is going to take place. Salah al Din does not uh, wait on them to decide the time. Salah al Din is calling all the shots. Uh, so the Muslim army gathers with Salah al Din, and Salah al Din uh, attacks the closest Christian uh, city, the Crusader city. Uh, in, in Tiberius, so you can see Salah al-Din attacks Tiberius. Uh, he comes in the end of June, attacks Tiberius on the 2nd of July, and causes them to move 30 kilometers to the east from Safuria to where Salah al-Din was. So Salah al-Din plays the game very well. It was the month of July, and the month of July uh, unlike South Africa, where uh, it is summer, or in Australia or other places, uh, it is winter in July. Uh, in Beit al Maqdis, it is summer. And Salah al Din, what he does is he controls the uh, places of water and uh, destroys the water wells on their way, uh, make them unusable. And while they are marching towards Salah al Din, Salah al Din burns the fields the wheat fields around them so they are under the heat of the sun under the heat uh, from the fields many of them when they reach the area Salah al Din had brought them to they are exhausted they are thirsty at night when they camp they don't let them sleep they constantly attack the crusader camps until Salah al Din uh, by the way, they broke the truce. There was a truce with the Crusaders, and it was broken by Renaud de Chatillon uh, and Salah al Din. Uh, there was unity, a weakness, disunity amongst the Crusaders. They didn't want, some of them didn't want to fight, some of them wa wanted to withdraw, and Salah al Din uses this very well. Uh, and even in the battlefield, he allows Raymond of Tripoli to escape the battlefield because he was against fighting Salah al-Din for strategic reasons. Salah al-Din, knowing of this, Salah al-Din allows his army to open a way for him, for him to withdraw and to head back to uh, his, uh, his uh, county. Uh, so Salah al-Din Ayyub uses this very well and he brings the crusaders to the point that he wanted to bring them and Salah al-Din with his Muslim army uh, always there is always an important decisive battle before the uh, Fath Salah uh, during the time of the Sahaba it was the battle of Yarmouk and this is close by this is actually not too far from where Yarmouk took, took place um, and it was a quite a close, uh, close area. This was a decisive battle. The Muslims uh, were victorious. The Crusaders uh, not just ha uh, suffered heavy losses, but uh, large numbers of them were either killed or captured. Amongst the nobles that were captured was the King Guy de Louisian uh, of the Latin King of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. His brother Renaud de Chatillon is now uh, under the. Uh, uh, imprisoned, being imprisoned by the armor of Salah al-Din, uh, counselors, grad, grandmasters of the Templars and Hospitallers, all of them were in that uh, place. Salah al-Din met with the uh, king uh, and uh, presented the king, Guy de Louisian. He saw him very thirsty. So Salah al-Din didn't offer him, by the way, water. Uh, in Islam or in Muslim culture, if you offer someone water, you offer them uh, safety, so they're not going to be killed. So Salah al-Din gives iced water brought from the mountains of Lebanon and those from uh, uh, southern Turkey, uh, Adana, 
and they have something called uh, car some when car what is it called if someone can remind me it is uh, ice with uh, some like uh, sauce on top of it uh, car some mm, oh i forgot the word so salahuddin offered him this iced uh, uh, bow of iced rose water and the king, king takes it and he cannot drink we know the chateau and says to him give it to me and uh he gives it to uh Reno de chateau it's in the hand of Reno de chateau salahuddin is busy with something else and the moment salahuddin sees it in the hands of uh, uh Reno de chateau he knocks it off his hand and he says i did not give the water to him what does that mean i did not uh give that water uh, or iced rose water to him uh because it means i have given him safety in his life i gave it to you king uh, and this is narrated by ibn shaddad in his uh book uh nawadir sultaniya uh salah uh knocks it off his hand and uh he uh says to to him do you remember your uh, murder of the Muslims? He reminds him of all his uh, sins and all his uh, war crimes. And Salah al-Din offers him a way out. Does anyone know what Salah al-Din uh, offers him? A way out so he's not killed. Although Salah al-Din has sworn that he will kill him with his own hand. Now Salah al-Din offers him a way out. Uh, what do you think Salah al-Din offers him? No answer. Ah, we're running out of time. I need to get to Beit al We still have. Yes, thank you very much, Fatima. He offers him Islam and uh, he says to him, if you accept Islam, then you will be safe and you will be our brother. Uh, with his arrogance, he responds no. And then Salah uh, reminds him of all his atrocities. And this is actually pictured in the film uh, Kingdom of Heaven uh, in quite precisely how it was, uh, how it took place. If you haven't watched it, that part is actually quite close. So Salah Din, you know, when he goes and attacks the grave of the Prophet, uh, he makes it uh, public and he says, I am going who will save Muhammad from my hands? He's so arrogant that he was saying this out loud that I'm going to dig out the grave of your prophet. And Salah al-Din stands him in front of him and he says, here I am coming to take uh, Muhammad Mink. Uh, I come here to uh, uh, protect the name of Muhammad from you. And then he offered him Islam, and when he did not, Salah al-Din pulled out his sword and hit him one off uh, with one blow. And then the people around him took his body out and thrown outside the uh, tent. And when the king saw this, he got so scared and started shaking, and Salah al-Din brought him and he said to him, it is not the custom of kings to kill kings. You are safe. Uh, so Salah al-Din Ayyubi uh, takes uh, uh, the life of this uh, murder, of this cr uh, criminal, and uh, he is uh, killed outside the uh, tent of uh, Salah al-Din uh, al-Ayyubi. Uh, Salah al-Din uh, not only uh, uh, killed Vinaldi Shatyun, but also the night templars and the um, uh, hospitalers and they were war criminals and Salah al-Din made sure that these war criminals will see uh, their end and Salah al-Din did not show them any uh, any any uh, compassion because they were war criminals who were killing the uh, Muslims uh, wherever uh, they found them. Uh, 
Now, if you were in the position of Salah al-Din after Hittin, would you go directly to Bayt al-Maqdis or would you do otherwise? What would you have done? Would you go directly from Hittin to uh, Jerusalem, from Hittin to Bayt al-Maqdis? It's about 100, uh, over 100 kilometers uh, away. What would you have done? If your aim in your whole life is to liberate Bayt al-Maqdis, what would you have done? Let's see. Okay, while you answer, I'll drink another glass of water <laughs> to try to be safe uh, or try to stay hydrated. Uh, it's not so, it's actually quite hot outside, but uh, uh, what would you have done? No answer, so I will continue. Go straight there. Thank you very much, uh, Muslima, to go straight to uh, to there. Continue to what, Wahi? Uh, continue to where? To Bayt al-Maqdis uh, or something else. What Salah al-Din did is quite interesting. Salah al-Din did not go to Bayt al-Maqdis directly. It took him another two months before getting to Bayt al-Maqdis. What Salah al-Din does is the following. He goes north towards Akka, sends his men to different places. The green line is Salah al-Din, heads all the way to Beirut. Salah al-Din goes to Beirut and to uh, all, instead of going south to Al-Masjid al-Aqsa and to Beit al-Maqdis, Salah al-Din heads to the north. He leaves out one city, the city of Sur, because he couldn't take it. And this later on becomes one of the biggest headaches for Salah al-Din and Ayyubi. Then Salah al-Din, afterwards heads all the way down to Asqalan. In the meantime, sends messages to the people in the city to surrender the city, and they will all be safe. They refuse it once, twice, three, and four times. Salah al-Din, while in Asqalan, met with a group from the from Beit al-Maqdis, the city, and he offered them to keep the city until next Easter. And they celebrate Easter, and then they can leave. They said, no, we will never give up the place of where our savior has died for our sins and you know the whole uh, the whole thing uh salah al-din instead uh says fine you do not i swear by allah i will take it by force so salah al-din intends to go to bayt al-maqdis and take it by force and you know in islam to take the city by force uh is actually uh has different uh laws and has different uh has different uh, uh, conditions. Uh, in Islam, a city can be conquered by uh, people accepting Islam. That's number one. Two is to accept the sovereignty of Islam and stay Christians in pages here. And three, to take it by war. Salah al-Din offered them many times. And each one has a different way that you deal with the places in that city. Uh, and Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi offered them this so they can keep their churches and keep everything as it is. They refused. Then Salah al-Din uh, heads towards the city. Uh, at that time, the film uh, Kingdom of Heaven actually focuses on around this guy, uh, Balian of Ibelin. Balian of Ibelin, the, what, uh, the way he's pictured in this film has nothing to do with reality, uh, to be honest. Uh, the, the romance and everything has nothing to do with Balian of Ibelin as a story. He was married to a queen, Queen Maria Komina, and he comes to Salah al-Din while Salah al-Din was besieging the city and asks Salah al-Din to grant him permission to enter the city for one night, to take his wife, the queen, and the people and leave the city. Salah al-Din, do you think he will accept? He's his enemy. Salah al-Din actually accepts and allows him to enter the city to take his wife and leave the city. The church leaders insist on him to leave the defense of the city. He sends a message to Salah al-Din apologizing that he's not leaving the city and he's going to fight against them. But Salah al-Din uh, goes by the rule that the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Even though he's his enemy, at least he can negotiate with him. But this worked out in this case against Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. In the city uh, uh, was Patriarch uh, Heraclius, and um, now supported by Balian of Ibelin, 
there was 60,000 soldiers, according to the Muslim accounts. A trench was, uh, a trench was dug around the city. In the city, there was uh, two queens, uh, Queen Sibella and also the wife of uh, baby and uh, Queen Maria. Salah al -Din reached the city on uh, the, 24th, the 21st of September, uh, 1187, and Salah al-Din headed uh, to attack the city from the uh, s western side. Uh, and then Salah al-Din for one full week went around the city until he knew exactly where the weakest point of the city was. Uh, he wasn't finding a suitable place initially. Then he went from uh, after one week from the 21st, then on the 26th, he comes to the northern side of the city, which was the weakest point, and uh, the crusaders would come out and fight against Salah al-Din. Salah al -Din bombarded the city with his uh, attack engines, and he was getting close to take down the city. The Muslims uh, had uh, the latest uh, the army technology of the time, the siege engines, uh, the Mongols were uh, bombarding the city, uh, the crusaders were responding with firing at the defendants, they attacked the Muslims, and in the process they killed the Muslim leader, Az al-Din Isa ibn uh, Malik, who was one of the great Muslim leaders. And the Muslims, when they saw he had uh, risen as a shaheed, they crossed the trench, uh, sapped the wall, and managed to raise the Muslim flag over the city. In that moment, the Crusaders went out to Salah al-Din saying that they're ready to surrender the city. Salah al-Din refused. And then, uh, this was after the, uh, the city was, uh, after the city uh, was breached, the walls were breached, uh, they asked for terms. Salah al-Din rejected all their offers and insisted that he will take the city like they took it 88 years ago uh, and he insisted that he will he will destroy everything in the city like they have uh, done these images are from the film uh, kingdom of uh, heaven uh, when they saw that the muslims were not willing to submit they sent out balian of ibn balian comes out to salah al -Din and uh, he says to salah al -Din, we will do the following if you do not accept our surrender. We will kill the 5,000 Muslim prisoners in our hands. We will kill our own women and children. We will destroy our properties, the houses, and we will destroy Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock, and we will fight. We have nothing to live for. We will fight you until death. You will have a city with nothing in the city whatsoever. Salah al-Din gathered his generals and the ulama around him and asked them what to do. And for saving the life of one Muslim, uh, they accepted that the surrender of the city should take place on the condition of taking it by war. So everyone in the city is Muslim property, including the people. Everyone will have to pay uh, fidya to free themselves. Everyone's enslaved to the Muslims. In order to free yourself, you have to uh, pay a ransom, uh, 10 for men, five for women, and two for children within 40 days, and you'll be escorted to a Christian uh, land. The city surrendered and conditionally, uh, they left the city. The Muslims entered on the 27th of Rajab, on the day uh, commemorating the uh, um, according to most Muslims, the uh, Muslim scholars, the uh, Isra and Mi'raj happened at that time. Uh, this gave Muslims a lot of uh, happiness entering on that day. It was a Friday uh, on the 2nd of October, 1187. Uh, Balian paid for a few thousand people. Salah al-Din let some of them off. The queen, they were told not to leave with any possessions. The queen left with her positions and slaves and Salah al allowed her. So did the patriarch and Sibella uh, asked to be reunited with her husband, Gidi Luzian, who was the king. He was imprisoned by Salah al in Nablus at that time. 
Salahuddin reunited her with her uh, husband in uh, in Nablus. Uh, uh, many noble women and men left without paying the ra ransom. Uh, Salahuddin freed 500 Armenians because they were not part of the crusade, so they were allowed to go. Uh, a, a thousand people who came for pilgrimage from Ruha, they told they were not crusaders. Salahuddin let them go. Husbands of crusader women, they came crying to him. Salahuddin even gave them get money and gifts as long as they can go back to Europe. Go back to your homes. Do not come back here except as pilgrims. And he uh, assigned officers at the gates to ensure uh, the Christian, the crusaders would have safe arrival to Christian uh, territory. What is interesting, Salah al-Din, imagine being in that army and imagine the joy of liberating al-Masjid al-Aqsa. Salah al-Din, uh, when you compare how they took the city 88 years earlier, Salah al-Din taking it and allowing people to leave in safety was fascinating. Uh, and that's why the name of Salah al-Din lives on until today. Uh, Salah al-Din was a man, uh, a great example of a Muslim leader. Uh, and he learns from the best. Uh, he learns from Omar ibn Khattab. Because on that day, when he took the city, uh, uh, many of his uh, army generals told him to destroy the church of the Holy Sepulchre. And Salah al-Din said, no uh, actually after uh, discussion he said no because omar gave them particularly an assurance to protect this church although salah Din could have church destroyed all the churches everything as a conqueror he has the right to do so even in that time uh international law uh, quote unquote uh, that's what conquerors do salah Din decides not to do so but he took some of the Christian properties, uh, like the house of the um, uh, patriarch, and turned it into a Hanapa. One of the churches, the Church of Saint Anne, was changed into a madrasa, a madrasa Salahiyah, because it, before the Crusades, it used to be also a madrasa for the Shafi'i. So Salah al-Din returned it to that. He made the building a hospital. He returned the Masjid al-Aqsa back to a masjid, and he moved the uh, cross from the top of the Dome of the Rock that was there for 88 years. Salah al-Din removes it and returns the, uh, the flag. Uh, before we come to the woman of the Arbaqir, Salah al-Din, uh, after cleaning Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa with the joy of all the Muslim uh, people uh, as Fatihin, Salah al-Din says to them, this is very, very important, bear this in mind. He says, do not think I have conquered this land with your swords. I have conquered it with the pen. Do not think I have conquered this land with your swords. Imagine being in the army of Salah al-Din and reaching and liberating Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And Salah al-Din turns around. Do not think your swords were the cause of the liberation. The cause of the liberation of this land was the knowledge and the pen uh, of the great scholar Al-Qadi Al-Fadil who was always by the side, side of Salah, uh, Salah al-Din. Uh, incredible uh, what Salah al-Din did. He goes into the uh, uh, Dome of the Rock, and the woman of the Arbaqir, whom Salah al-Din came to their city a few years back, they said they gave Salah al-Din uh, a gift for Masjid al-Aqsa, and it was handmade rose Roses were collected and made into rose water. And this rose water uh, is now uh, given to Salah al-Din to cleanse the uh, rock of the uh, Bayt al-Maqdis. Salah al-Din cleanses the rock with this rose water, with his own hands. He cleanses the rock and then uh, prays in it. He then brings the member of his teacher, Nur al-Din Zinki, from Aleppo, he orders that the member is brought, but that was on a Friday, they entered the city. And then the following Friday, the first khutbah was delivered in Masjid Al-Aqsa, and the first khutbah was incredible. Just read the full khutbah, you will enjoy every word, and you will pray for 
the next khutbah of the liberation of al-Masjid al-Aqsa, you can see it in the screen, he emphasized the extent, the Imam Ibn Zaki uh, emphasized, he was from Aleppo, he was the uh, scholar, one of the ulama of Aleppo, when Salah al-Din took Aleppo, he says to Salah al-Din, uh, a very nice line of poetry, but in his khutbah, he, uh, he brings together everything in the importance of al-Masjid al-Aqsa telling the people this is the dwelling place of your father Ibrahim, the spot from where your prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ascended to the heaven. The qibla which you turned you to pray at the commencement of Islam. He's telling them it is your first qibla, the abode of the prophets, a place visited by saints, the prophets, the command of the, this is a place where wahi came down. This is a place, the holy land which Allah has spoken in his precious Quran. It is a place where all people will be assembled for the judgment and resurrection will take place from here. He gathers in such a short khutbah everything around the importance of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. After Salah al-Din liberates Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and this, uh, if there are any questions, please write your questions again now uh, on this topic. Please keep the questions on this topic. Uh, and then we will uh, try to deal with them in the next five minutes. Uh, so I will, the third crusade uh, was because Salah had been liberated Beit al Maqdis from them. It was led by three major kings in Europe. And uh, one of them, the one that stayed behind, was Richard the Lionheart. Uh, and Salah had been uh, fought against him. He won some battles, lost some battles, and eventually they signed a peace treaty. But in the process, uh, in the negotiation between him and Salah al-Din, he says to Salah al-Din, go back to the lands where you came from. And Salah al-Din says, it was only because of the weakness of us that you took this land, but this land is originally ours. But Salah al-Din is faithful to Homer's and Islam's uh, inclusive vision, and he says the following. He says, uh, when he tells him, go back, this place is holy only for us, Salah al-Din says to him, al-Qudsu lana kama huwa lakum. It is ours as much as it is yours. Indeed for us it is greater than it is for you. So Salah al-Din is inclusive, not exclusive. It is the place where our Prophet came. You can see how important it was to Salah al-Din. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. The crusades from that time never ended. But I would like to end with the last will of Salah al-Din. What Salah al-Din, after liberating Bayt al-Maqdis, his goal from when becoming the Sultan in Egypt, his goal was to do what? To liberate Bayt al-Maqdis. After liberating Bayt al-Maqdis, what is the next goal of Salah al-Din? You will be shocked. Uh, Salah al-Din wanted to go to Europe, wanted to go to Scotland and Italy and England as a refugee, as Muslims go there today. Salah al-Din wanted to go to these places. And this is directly from Salah al-Din as quoted by Ibn Shaddad. He says... In my heart, I feel, after I liberate the land, the rest of the land from the Crusades, I would give right my wasiyah, I would divide it amongst the uh, uh, emirs, and then I will take sh the ships and go follow them, the Crusaders, into their islands. I will follow them in their different lands and cities until no one on the first of this earth does not believe in Allah or I die. This is narrated by Ibn Shaddad directly from the mouth of Salah al-Din that his next goal after liberating Bayt al-Maqdis is to conquer the world and to bring everyone to Islam. Amazing will of Salah al-Din. Today the name of Salah al-Din lives in Al-Masjid al-Aqsa in the Dome of Yusuf. Uh, his name is written there. Also, it is there over the mihrab of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him. Uh, it is uh, amazing uh, to have uh, this as Sadaqa Jariya from the time of Salah al-Din. He passes away on the 27th of Safar in Damascus in 1193. And his grave is in Damascus next to the Umayyad Mosque. And he has not left behind gold or silver 
uh, but very, very little things were left behind uh, from Salah al-Din. From the time of Salah al-Din, the Crusades never ended. Every century, there was many attempts to for the Crusades to continue. Um, next week, we will continue with the continuation of the Crusade, inshallah, Azza wa Jal. Okay, let's go through the questions. Uh, <laughs> okay. Was Salah al-Din or his ancestor related by blood to any of the Sahaba? Um, actually, Salah al-Din, as Ibn al atiyu says, and as it is already, uh, it is very well known, Salah al-Din was from Kurdish descent. Uh, one of his brothers, the brothers of Salah al-Din, in order to create legitimacy, tried to claim that they have some Mayyad descent, but this is not proven. Uh, indeed, he was an inspirational leader. Tyre was not captured at that time, and it took a very long time to capture it. Uh, and uh, may Allah have mercy on Salah al-Din. Some people say it was his mistake. Uh, not taking tire, but it was Salah al-Din said something important on that. Uh, when after Hittim, he says, If Allah opens a gate for you, put this quotation in your mind. If Allah opens a gate for you, keep walking in that direction until before this gate closes. So when Allah gave him the victory, Salah al-Din did not want to lose this. That's why he moved fast from that place. Okay, another question. If Jerusalem hadn't peacefully surrendered, would Omar, Omar Fatih be considered an occupation, assuming Omar would have gone there to war? Uh, uh, Salah al-Din took it by force, the city. But the Muslim Fatih is different from any other occupation. When the Muslims conquer a place, when the Muslims take any place, they do not turn... Uh, turn it into hell for its people. You saw, for example, the occupation of Iraq in modern time, or the occupation of Afghanistan, or the occupation of Palestine, or the occupation or the attack that happened in, in Bosnia. You see what occupation actually means. And occupation in the 7th century, uh, before Prophet Muhammad uh, you see the example of the Persians. Uh, walking into the city of Elia and uh, massacring uh, tens of thousands of Christians. Uh, the same was done by the Byzantines when they came back, the Romans. Islam, there are ethics of war in Islam. Ethics of war in Islam, you're not allowed to kill a woman, child. Even at the time of war, they're not collateral damage. You're not allowed to attack them, even people, religious people. You're only allowed to attack an army. However, in other uh, cultures, even today, the Western uh, occupation of Iraq, killing men, women, and children, the Zionists, what they do, they do not have this. Ethics of war in Islam is very high, and this is the difference between Fatih and occupation. I hope that clears it. What is the significance of the Holy Land and the Crusaders in particular? It is the place where Jesus, it is associated to uh, the Christian faith, uh, the place of Isa, uh, peace be upon him. So the place, the holiest place in Christianity is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where they believe that Jesus was crucified. And that's what makes it so. And they have the Via della Rosa, the uh, pathway of pain, where they walk on the footsteps of Jesus. It is associated, the holiness is associated to Jesus, their uh, savior. It's the liberation or could it be before him? Uh, Fatima, thank you for the question. Uh, we do not need to wait for a Mahdi. Uh, I like this, uh, an Egyptian brother who passed away, may Allah have mercy on him, brother, Dr. Karim. He said to me that every time has its Mahdi. The time of Salah al-Din, the Mahdi of his time was Salah al-Din. Salah al-Din was a Mahdi. He was on one path and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in his heart the love of the Masjid al-Aqsa, and then he became the Mahdi of his time, Salah al-Dunya wa din But in our time, we do, we do not need to wait for the Mahdi. We have to become the Mahdis ourselves and liberate Bayt al-Maqdis. I hope that uh, makes uh, sense. Is today's world strat strategy we need to follow? Yes, uh, we need to follow the path of Salah al-Din and Nur al-Din. 
And Islam is always uh, bear this in mind. Islam is an in in inclusive, encompassing uh, religion, and we need to always hold the ideal ideals of Islam uh, high. Uh, the present situation that uh, yes, they pray in the masjid, but there are times when the Muslims, particularly in the morning are not allowed in and they wait at the gates and the Zionists are now starting to pray inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, Azra. Your Masjid, your first Qibla, Zionists are already and in the next few weeks they have some religious holidays and they want to blow the shofar, you know, the trumpet inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa as a religious action. They wear their traditional uh, temple uh, dresses, gears, uh, when they're coming inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa. Masjid Al-Aqsa is in a very difficult position uh, today. Uh, yes, Salah din in the peace uh, treaty that he signed in Ramla, uh, he, uh, they kept a strip of land with them. And one of the Zionist leaders recently said something interesting, that uh, the Zionist state is going to uh, be narrowed down to looking at the example of the crusade to a small strip of land in the northern uh, Palestine. Uh, yes, by the way, thank you very much, Banu. Salah Din actually prepared to go to Hajj. He's never been on Hajj in his life. Uh, and Salah Din prepared, he even was ready to wear his ihram from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa to fulfill the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Rasul, and uh, as he was preparing to go, the third crusade, took place, uh, that was coming. So Salah Din actually, he was in, in crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because many of the Muslims after the liberation went back home and left Salah Din uh, alone. Uh, very interesting how Salah Din has not, not gone to Hajj, but I am so amazed Salah Din, Muslims have made Hajj on behalf of Salah Din so many times over the different centuries. A man who didn't, didn't go on Hajj in his life Every century, when a Muslim hears that Salah al-Din did not do his hajj, goes and uh, makes hajj on behalf of Salah al-Din. You be may Allah accept it on behalf of Salah al-Din. Is there any way to know which knowledge is liberated, which knowledge to retain from our history? You have to figure that out yourself, uh, Dimas. We have to figure that as an ummah and try to uh, work uh, on uh, on this. Yes, Salah al-Din was definitely Kurdish, as we know from the historical accounts. He was from the Rawadiyya tribe in Central Asia. Uh, but at that time, notions of nationalism was never an issue for Muslims. Nur al-Din was of Turkmen origin. Salah al-Din was Kurdish. All of them worked for the sake of Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala. Uh, Oh, this is uh, a lot to take. Yes, uh, student of the Quran. Madrasa Nidamiya was created by Nidam al Mulk, a Seljuk uh, wazir, and it had brought on board many great scholars like Imam al Ghazali, and it was to confront uh, Balkhini, uh, Shia, and other creeds that were going around, particularly in different forms, even uh, philosophy. Uh, the Fatimis were pushing some of these ideas forward, and even the, the Hashashin and the others. It was to confront these ideologies and to create a strong Muslim with a strong basis associated with the Quran and the Hadith uh, of uh, the Prophet sallallahu Yes, uh, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabb, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always take us from the dark to the light and keep us on the right uh, path. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Imam, yes, true. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I heard this from my father uh, when I was young. He read from Imam Suyuti that Imam al Mahdi will be number 40 Khalifa. He will be the 40th Khalif in Bayt al Maqdis. Uh, that's what I recall. I need to double check this. So he'll be the 40th Khalif in Bayt al Maqdis, which uh, uh, later on. Uh, Isa alayhi salam and great things will take uh, place. Uh, two more questions, three more questions and we will uh, finish off. Can we make sure that the next liberation will be the last liberation? Uh, inshallah, we will hope to do that. But 
during this time, Allah says in the Quran, the uh, Bani Israel will come back again. Uh, we have to make sure that we never lose Bayt al Maqdis again. And we have to make sure this by having a strong uh, Muslim youth and a strong Muslim ummah that will never ever give up Al Masjid Al Aqsa uh, in its life uh, again. However, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, with the Dajjal will come 70,000 Jews from Isfahan. Isfahan is in, e in Iran today. Uh, and many of the scholars say this is what Allah refers to in the Quran. And if you try to come with uh, uh, facade and aggression again, we will come back and punish you with uh, the servants of uh, Allah. Um, yes, did Salah uh, al-Din al and those who were involved in education and knowledge production uh, leave behind framework for the liberation? Yes, uh, the framework, uh, uh, Kashmiri, and I pray to Allah 786, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also for the liberation of Kashmir and all Muslim lands. Uh, um, Salah al-Din left us a framework, uh, which we have discussed today, is that uh, the framework of Nur al-Din, we start with knowledge, unity of the Muslims, and then number three, the liberation of Baitul Maqdis. And the unity has to be in the circles uh, of the Muslims all the way to the last circle. And please read on the Baraka circle theory, which based on some of these examples, give us a direction uh, for the uh, future. Uh, Ismail, mm, yes, this is uh, a miniature of Qubba uh, Sakra and the domes around it. Uh, and this is was given to me as a gift, uh, an armor of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Uh, and it has on it the uh, beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you can see here, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Musawwar, Al-Mu'in, and... Uh, that's the uh, armor I put it uh, to remember great men like Muhammad al Fatih and uh, Salah, uh, Salah uh, al Ayyubi, particularly when we are uh, talking about him. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, during the Crusades, uh, why did the Crusaders not destroy Al Masjid al Aqsa? Because when they saw the Dome of the Rock and the incredible Muslim architecture. They have never seen anything this like this in their life. And they even called it the Temple of Solomon, uh, that this is magnificent. This is from the time of great, uh, Solomon. It's impossible that humans are able to do something like this. So they turned it into a church instead of destroying it, exactly the same that they did in Cordoba, for example, where they changed the uh, Cordoba into something uh, else. Um, how many khilaf, uh, khilafa thus far? Uh, there is no khalifa in Bayt al Maqdis, zero so far. Uh, so we have uh, some time uh, to, to, to go. To go. Um, the ethnic cleansing of Kurds in the 90s, uh, the one that did it, uh, he claimed to be. Uh, uh, on the path of Salah al -Din, uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, but uh, there is many atrocities like what happened to the Kurds in Iraq uh, and the massacres that took place. But it's a complicated uh, matter in the sense that there was even many Kurds involved in the, uh, in the, uh, in the process. Uh, the place where the Red Sea it is not known uh, exactly. Uh, Jewish scripture mentioned a third temple. They talk about the temple coming down from the sky. That's what they infer to as uh, as that. Um, yes, the the Jal cannot enter four mosques. One of them is the Masjid al-Aqsa, but he will enter Bayt al-Maqdis, the region, and he will be killed in Lut inside Bayt al-Maqdis, but not inside the Masjid. Uh, we answered this one. Uh, yes, it is in the second circle, as it is extremely important, and the people in the uh, city of Bayt al-Maqdis 
and the people in Palestine know that the preparations that are going on um, in Gaza, uh, the knowledge preparation, the military preparation, uh, all of it, inshallah, will lead to the liberation of Al Masjid Al Aqsa Al Mubarak. Uh, 20 minutes for questions. Uh, we are done. Jazakumullah khair. Next week is our last week. In preparation for next week, I will ask uh, you to uh, please read an article uh, on uh, the Crusades and the continuation of the Crusades. Uh, because uh, I, I want to uh, get over it very uh, quickly. The article uh, is uh, the continuation of the colonialist project from Crusades, uh, from the Crusades to Zionism. That's the title of the article. Uh, I would very much appreciate if you would um, uh, read the article. I will uh, uh, send the link here and then uh, you can uh, find it, uh, inshallah, um, on uh, this link also. Uh, so, the continuation of the colonialist project from the crusade to Zionism, uh, you will find the link on uh, online and it talks about from the Crusades until the modern period, how this uh, project actually continued and makes references to Christopher Columbus, uh, which is quite interesting. And I advise you to uh, read this in preparation for next week. And inshallah, next week we'll discuss the homework that you need to submit for uh, passing this course. Jazakumullah khair, an honor being with you, akramakumullah, and inshallah, we shall meet uh, next Sunday at 4 p.m. Baytul Maqdis time. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and keep us in your dark.